Blog Talk Radio. Are you ready to take a bite out of the competition? Are you looking for ideas to make your business better? Welcome to the Core Business Show with Tim GK, sponsored by Apple Capital Group. At the core of every successful business, you'll find people making a difference. And with each episode of the Core Business Show, we talk with those people, examine those ideas, and explore the strategies that make them special. Now, the host of the Core Business Show, Tim GK. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Core Business Show. I'm Tim J.K., your host. Today, I have the pleasure of having Jeffrey Sloan. He's the Managing Director at Triangle Capital Access in Georgia. We're going to talk about debt and equity financing. If you have any questions, please post them in the chat room, or you can call 347-324-3460. Well, Jeffrey, welcome to the program. Thank you. Glad to be here. I guess to, to begin with, kind of tell us about yourself. Our audience like to get a personal view, background on the person versus just reading the bio. So just tell us about yourself. Sure. And how you guys started. Well, I've been, yeah, I've been in the finance career almost since I started in business after a three-year career as a teacher. So figure. But um spent uh, almost 30, 35 years in banking and asset-based lending, kind of getting mm-hmm. an understanding of how loans are made to small businesses and gravitated off into an investment banking deal for about five years where I was involved in a bunch of equity and debt raises. Went back into asset-based lending and then seven years ago started Triangle Capital based on that knowledge base of making loans to small businesses and now working with small businesses, I'd say small and middle market, that have a capital need. And the capital need, in my case, where what I'm good at is helping companies whose need is driven either by rapid growth, in which case it gets closer to equity, uh, the solution does, or whose need is driven by some level of financial discomfort or distress, which means they're having trouble getting the loans they need or the equity they need. Wow. Kind of ironic, I used to be a teacher as well. How the transition from being a teacher to banking, does it give you a, a better foothold in kind of explaining things to people a little bit better, or how did that prepare you for that career? Well, it's interesting you should ask that question, Tim, because I think one of my greatest strengths is my ability to communicate. And the Mm -hmm. problem a lot of business owners have, or even the financial management within small and middle market businesses, is they're very good at what they do within their business when it comes to communicating with bankers or asset-based lenders or factors or equity providers, private equity sponsors. They really don't know how to speak that language. So I'm not so sure my teaching experience, I mean, or I had good uh, basic communication skills. Well, what is most important in my job is communicating clearly to the capital resources. I'll use that generic term for debt, equity, whatever, is that I understand how they think. I understand how they underwrite deals. I know what the issues are going to be in a transaction before I go talk to them. So I help my clients get prepared to talk to them and help pave the way and be sure the communications are clear. It's about Can communication. Tell us, okay. Tell us what type of experience you normally have with a typical person applying for some type of uh, any loan? Yeah, well, what I like to do is put on my lender hat, let's say, if, if it's a loan situation or mezzanine hat, if it's a growth capital situation, and ask them to share their financial information with me on a confidential basis, no charge, usually no charge. I'll review that, give them some feedback in a day or two and say, hey, I think I can help you get, get what you need, or I don't think I can help you get what you need. If I think I can, then I have a, you know, try to formalize a business arrangement, a working arrangement within which generally we're looking at a three to five month, maybe two to five month process to get them prepared to go to the capital markets. And then for me to actually take the point and um, introduce them to capital resources that I believe will be responsive to their needs and just help manage the whole process for them. Okay. So I'm, I'm what you call, we used to use this term, the asset-based lending business. I'm a deal junkie. I mean, I talk to a lot of people about a lot of different deals, but I try to pick and choose the ones where I think I can add value. Okay. Which is to say, get the job done. Absolutely. Any particular things that you have seen in your career that in the past was a problem and has been fixed, now you're saying there is now is a new problem? Uh, You mean sort of from a macro perspective? From a micro uh, perspective, you know, you see like a, a whole bunch of issues on this end. Now we created another, we got this done, maybe, but or, or you might see the same issues over and over. Maybe it's financials. It's maybe 
the person who's intermingling his personal finances with his business oh, finances. Yeah. You know, it's a little bit hard to pick themes like that, but the interesting thing about small business in America is everyone is different. The personalities are different. The way they run their business is different. The product or service they provide is, for the most part, different. I mean, you can put them into broad categories, sick codes or whatever, but they're all different. But I would say, you know, the, the, the common theme that seems to run through the clients that I work with is, A, they're undercapitalized, and B, <laughs> I hate to say it, but they really don't know how to communicate exactly what's going on financially in their business to the capital resources that they're trying to get money from. And by the way, they often talk to the wrong resources. They go where they're absolutely going to get the client, and then they get discouraged because they don't they don't know what they look like to the lender or to the mezzanine lender or to the private equity group, and they, they waste so, their time you know, going down mm-hmm. paths that aren't going to get them anywhere. So is there certain things that they actually need to always prepare for before actually looking at applying for anything? You give absolutely. them a, like a little checklist. Oh, I've got a laundry list, a standard data request list. It's got like eight or ten items on it, but it's a laundry list. I mean, financial statements, three years financials, okay. projections, just a whole lot of stuff. But but every the trick is not just to give the data. It's to package it and formulate it and analyze it and help the lender understand what it means. Can you, If you don't mind, can you go ahead and tell us what that ten item check sheet is in case people don't understand what they are? Yeah, I'll try to pull it up while I'm reading here. It's the basic financial package is going to include, you know, your historical financial statements. Typically, I mean, depending on how old the company is, you like to get at least two or three years of historical financials, the year-end numbers. If they don't have financials, it should be tax returns. You want a current interim financial statement, P&L and balance sheet, preferably with the prior year comparable. If we're talking May 2012, we should also have a May 2011, so we can do a comparative analysis. Mm-hmm. Depending on what type of financing they're seeking, well, in almost all cases, it's good to have an accounts receivable aging and an accounts payable aging as of the date of the most current balance sheet, say May 31st. Mm-hmm. It's nice if they have a business plan which describes the business and its operations and all that stuff. It's not essential. As well, it may become essential, particularly if you're talking about junior capital, mezzanine, or equity. But um, they should have projections least, you know, monthly through the end of the current year and at least one or two years out, you know, into the future, 2013, 2014. If they're trying to borrow money on assets, which most of them are, or secure the loan, then nice if they have appraisals. I wouldn't ask them to go get one if they don't have them. If they've had appraisals done of their machinery and equipment or their inventory or their real estate, should be taking a look at that. Bios or summaries, uh, curriculum, vitae, whatever you want to call them, on the key people in the company. And they should be selling documents, the bios, how good they are, mm-hmm. what they do, and how great their experience is. And there, there are a bunch of other things that, that sort of go along with that. I wasn't able to pull it up here because I can't multitask that well. No, that, that's um, all right. So kind of tell us why you're looking for that, your thoughts on if a person who is under a year in operation, what could they actually look for realistically in this process? They either well, the are a startup or they in biz- business, you know, less than one year, which they might not have all of that. Absolutely, they might not. And the, the basic information you still need is just they won't have the historical financials, right? They'll just have mm-hmm. something. they got to have something for the current year, or they should. But, but, hey, here's the thing. What that tells me right away is they're wasting their time if they go talk to a bank. And there are always exceptions. When I say things like that, Tim, Hey, maybe the owner has a big personal net worth, very liquid, big investment portfolio and that kind of thing. He could go to a bank, but he's going to get the loan based on his personal assets and his personal net worth, not on the company. But if we're talking about the company's ability to attract capital, it's a startup situation. The options are going to be limited. And it's probably not going to be bank. It's probably not going to be asset-based lending. It's probably going to be factoring. In other Mm -hmm. words, he's going to have to sell his receivables or do a financing deal based not on his financial strength, but on the financial strength of his customers. And the factor will either buy his receivables or do some sort of uh, loan against their estimate of the uh, creditworthiness of his customer base. That's how a lot of small companies get going. The, the problem with that kind of financing is it's very expensive, and it uh, it almost cannot be sustained long-term by a, by a young business, unless it's very profitable. Okay. So it's, it's really a stepping stone. 
Yeah, they have, okay. they have good margins. Yeah. There are other things they might do. Startup company, I mean, there's a thing called purchase order financing where, you know, they've got a fair, for them a fairly large purchase order, let's say $50,000 or something, but they need to go import something or, you know, whatever it is they're selling. They, they don't have the credit with their suppliers. Well, you can, depending on how solid that purchase order is, you can finance that. You can get people that will step in and substitute their credit for yours with your vendor so that he'll ship the goods, you sell the goods, then you pay off the, the purchase order financing loan. A lot of different ways to go at the startup thing, but the plain fact of the matter is it's expensive financing. It's the most expensive form of financing. And that's because but of the highest risk. Now, younger companies, yeah. by definition, are in a higher risk mode. Yes, you just have to do it. Just have to bite the bullet. Just make sure you have the margins covered. If we take debt and equity financing in a nutshell, can you kind of give us a definition of what is debt financing, what is equity financing? Sure. Debt is secured or unsecured lending. I mean, it's a loan that the company takes out. You sign a loan document. If you're a strong company. Maybe you don't have to pledge collateral specifically. You don't have to file a UCC financing statement in which you pledge certain assets against the loan. Most, well, I don't deal in unsecured debt. All of my clients, as I said, they're either high-growing or they're experiencing some kind of difficulties financially, and so they're going to have to pledge assets. So mm -hmm. it's a secured loan from a bank, going to carry an interest rate. Depending on the asset that secures it, it may have an amortization schedule. Obviously, if it's a fixed asset, equipment, or real estate, there will be a monthly payment. If it's based on current assets, receivables, and or inventory, it could be just an interest-only loan, which is more helpful for the young company that's not yet very profitable. I like to say junior capital as opposed to equity, because but let's go right to equity. That's at the bottom of your balance sheet. That's your paid-in capital, your initial stock, whatever uh, forms your net worth. Not really a loan. When you get equity, you're not getting a loan. You're getting an investment from either an individual or an institutional investor who's not going to charge you an interest rate. He's going to own a percentage of your business. It's a whole different ball game. And frankly, while I do some things in the equity markets, that's not my bag. It's a totally different ball game as to how you get that money and what it costs mm -hmm. you. It doesn't cost you okay. in terms of call on your earnings and cash flow. It costs you in terms of ownership of the business. No, sure. But what I do in between there is what I, it's called mezzanine lending, or some people would call it subordinated debt, but that's more of a technical term for um, a marketable instrument. It's different. But mezzanine loans are simply between senior debt and equity. And they have uh, characteristics of both. Mezzanine loan will have a coupon rate or interest rate, it's typically pretty high, 10 to 14%. And it will also give the mezzanine lender the right to any warrants to purchase for almost nothing some percentage of the business, typically 5 to 15%. Okay. So it's higher risk, generally oriented towards high growth situations. And if, you look at the balance sheet, if you look at the balance sheet of a company, excuse me, it's, I'm, when you no, talk okay. senior loans or loans, we're looking at the top part of the liability section. When we talk about mezzanine financing, we're right in the middle, below senior debt, but above equity. When we talk about equity, we're at the very bottom of the balance sheet. Any particular industries that's ideal for equity financing? Equity financing, remember, I just said it's not my bag, but the okay. reason it isn't is the ground rules are very, very subjective. And whereas with senior debt and even mezzanine financing, the ground rules, that is, the underwriting criteria that the lenders use is relatively uniform. I mean, okay. you can you can figure out what you can and can't do based on the situation. With equity, you never know. You never know how much of their business they're going to want for the amount of the investment you need. What you what is common with equity is they're looking for very high growth situations. They typically okay. are looking for very experienced operators people who really know what they're doing, have made money in some other venture, similar venture, and, you know, they just want to come along for the ride. They really okay. they really don't back industries, although they tend to focus on healthcare right now. It's very hot, obviously. It, <laughs> I think it always will be a huge industry. Mm -hmm. You know, biotechnology, software, anything connected with the Internet. These kinds of businesses can attract a lot of money, a lot of equity money, but they... The average guy says, ooh, I've developed a wonderful software program. It may be, 
But if he hasn't been in software development all his life, if he hasn't built and sold a successful software business, the chances of getting equity are very slim. Wow. And you didn't ask this I'm question, not- but I'm going to answer it. I'm Go going to answer a question anyway. You say, okay, well, why don't I want to fool with equity? Because I want to work with companies where I know I can get the deal done. And why do I do that? Am I altruistic? Is it just want to help companies? No. I want to make money. And I make money not by signing up a client. I make my money when I get them the loan they need, the capital they need. So I just find equity too hard. It's just too hard to predict Mm -hmm. whether I can get equity for a company. And even if I do, whether they'll accept the terms that come along with it. They don't want to give up 45% of their business. We're going to take a break real quick. When we be back, we have someone to come and ask us to clarify mezzanine financing. We'll be back in a moment to take a station break. We're talking to Jeffrey Sloan, Management Director of Triangle Capital Access, talk about debt and equity finance. We'll be back in one moment. You're listening to The Core Business Show, sponsored by Apple Capital Group. Apple Capital Group in Jacksonville, Florida, is a commercial lender that specializes in asset-based loans, equipment leasing and financing, invoice financing, commercial real estate loans, and asset-based financing in the U.S. and Canada. Apple Capital Group is a direct lender that lends on their private equity investment portfolio. Ninety percent of most loans are decided within two hours, and vendor funding within 24 hours after documents are completed with a one-page application. No slow no's, just a quick decision and a fast yes. To get more information about lending from Apple Capital Group, call 866-611-7457. That's 866-611-7457 to speak with one of our loan specialists. Or visit us right now at applecapitalgroup.com. Welcome back to The Core. Once again, here's Tim Japan. We're talking with Jeffrey Sloan, the Managing Director of Triangle Capital Access. We're talking about debt and equity financing. Jeffrey, we were talking just before the break regarding mezzanine. Someone had a question. Can you kind of clarify about the mezzanine financing? Yeah. It's, again, it's like the mezzanine in a building or a store. It's in between senior debt and equity. And it has okay. the characteristic of both. And it typically is structured as a three- to five-year interest-only loan may or may not be secured by assets. In most cases, it's not. But it also has what they call an equity kicker, where the person investing, making the equity investment, will have the right to purchase some percentage of the business for, for nothing. I mean, they're basically just going to get 5 or 10% of the business. Okay. And by right. the way, I would say that's frightening to some entrepreneurs, but it, they really don't want to own the business or control it. The mezzanine people don't. They want the economic value of that percentage ownership that they're, they're given as part of the deal. Some owners are really, really protective regarding their business and maybe not understanding you're giving a percentage away. So well, why would I get a percentage? And they don't understand the concept they're actually investing and they're taking a risk. If it fails, it's, it's really on them. Have you ever run into some cases, some owners are just, just not understanding, don't want to give up more control of their company, which is not really control. He's still the majority owner, but they just don't get it. Absolutely. And it's, you know, I'm not a, well, I am a business owner. I'm an entrepreneur, but not the way a manufacturer or distributor or wholesaler is. But the thing that's very interesting about it to me is most business owners, they don't want to give up equity. And often, if that's the only form of capital they can get, they're short-circuiting their growth potential in the way In the right situation, the way they should view it, whether it's mezzanine or pure equity, is with this money, if they can grow their business two, three, or ten times as big as this without that money, and they're giving up 10 or 15 percent, you know, now they have 85 percent two, three, four years later, something that's 10 times as big as it was. They don't get the money. They're going to go 100 percent or two times as big. They got 100 percent, but the value of it's worth less than if they own 85 percent of it. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They, yeah. They, it, it, but it only works well if they can really use that money to really grow the business. And trust me, that's what the equity people are looking for is high growth situations run by very capable people, experienced and capable. I deal almost exclusively, I can see, but I kind of like that attitude amongst business owners because I work mm-hmm. in the senior debt market primarily. I help them work senior leverage. They don't want to give up ownership? Fine. I'll leverage the heck out of every asset they've got. They'll borrow as much money as they can possibly get. And, you know, that's a two-edged sword. 
They have to be able to afford the carrying costs of that money. The equity has no carrying costs. The debt, obviously, interest and maybe principal payments. So it's it's a balancing act. I so do they understand? Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. You find most business no, owners? Say, yeah, you're absolutely right. Most, most business owners, they they don't even want to think about giving up equity. It's just not because it's their baby, it's their business, and they think they should be able to borrow money to make it grow. If they can, great, and I'll help them do that. If they can't and they don't want to deal with equity, then, you know, they'll have to go to mom and dad or, <laughs> you know, rich uncle or something to get the money, <laughs> which, you know, wow. there's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. When it's dealing with commercial real estate and equipment, also you have in your portfolio as well. How do you actually handle those particular situations? What type of deals do you look at when it comes to real estate? Most of the real estate deals I get involved in are connected to working capital financing. In other words, okay. the manufacturing that owns his facility and he's got some equity in it. He may have a mortgage on it or he may not, but he needs to refinance his own occupied plant or facility. Uh, in order to get some additional capital for his business. That's really what I do in real estate. Income producing properties, you know, shopping centers, hotels. I don't, it's, I'm, I'm business oriented, not real estate mm-hmm. oriented. So that's how okay. I do real estate. Machinery and equipment is, it's a challenge for most of my clients because most of them are not performing well financially. And so equipment lenders, of course, they have these fixed charge coverage tests. They want the company to be able to show that it can make the payments. It's had made enough cash flow over the last year, year and a half to make the payments on the loan they're planning to make to them. A lot of my clients aren't going to qualify for that. So there, are, there are ways to get the money, but, you know, as I said earlier, if they're in a high-risk situation, meaning they're not, they've not historically generated enough cash flow to repay the kind of loan they want, that money's going to be very, very expensive. There are companies well, you- that will- just at least the equipment back to them. And, you know, but that, that's the last resort. It, it ends up being very, very costly. Well, when you talk about that. that particular situation, you know, is it unrealistic that they want $250,000 worth of equipment that they can't even afford to make the payments on? And they're hoping that if I had this piece of equipment, my cost would go down because I don't have to outsource it. And I have the opportunity to make more money. In that sense, does it really make sense for them to go do that? Uh, should they go in baby steps, understanding that if you have a $250,000 loan, you have a payment that is going to be due in 30 to 60 days, and you have to have the cash flow, the business to either cover it. What is ideal for a company in that particular situation? Should they go in pieces, maybe get this one that can give me additional revenue to try to bump me up there? Or realistically, should they be looking at a piece of equipment that's worth two hundred fifty thousand dollars and they only earn three or four hundred thousand dollars a year? Yeah, it's a great question, and it sort of speaks to what I said earlier about communication. It's fine for the business owner to say to a lender or to himself, "Hey, if I had this four million dollar piece of equipment, I'd lower my production costs by fourteen percent, and that way I could pay for the equipment, and also I could make." better product or different product and generate more sales. Well, that's a great story, and I do call them stories, but <laughs> if, if the story makes sense, and this is what I try to do, figure out if it makes sense. If the story makes sense, then he, but he needs to be able to communicate that story in financial terms to an equipment lender that will buy into the story. I can't change the story for my clients, but I can help them tell that story, if it's true, in a way that will attract the, uh, the equipment financing they want. So the answer to the question is, well, it depends on whether the guy really knows what he can do with that piece of equipment and whether he has the ability to provide specific information to a lender to convince the lender he will increase sales, he will lower his gross margin, he will make more money with his piece of equipment so he'll be able to pay for it. That's do you run to oh, That's a trick. Yeah. Do you run a lot of those type of situations, uh, those type of uh, scenarios that – he wants or she wants this type of equipment, but not understanding the, the whole picture and have to explain that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, the younger a company is, the harder, I mean, in terms of they've only been in business six months or a year and a half, it's much harder to tell the story because they probably don't have very sophisticated financial management and reporting systems. So there's only so much you can do with the data they have. And mm-hmm. like I said, the trick is, in the data they have, lay 
layering in what this piece of, into the numbers, what this piece of equipment would do, documenting and supporting your assumptions and your intentions about how wonderful this is going to be for your business. If you don't have the ability to put together that kind of data, then you're, you're kind of struggling. But Tim, the, another thing that yeah. is, that I face more often than that is a company that says, Hey, I've got a million dollars worth of equipment and I only want to borrow $300,000 on it. This should be easy. And everybody turns them down. Well, business owners always overestimate the value of their equipment. I'm talking used equipment now, number one. And mostly mm -hmm. what I do, not so much finance new equipment, is refinancing used equipment to get some money out of it that they can use in their operations. But they think in terms of the value of the equipment, you know, what's the market value of this or what did I pay for it? But lenders think mm -hmm. in terms of they had to sell it, what did they get for it? So that million dollars worth of equipment may only be worth on the market to stress sale, let's just say $400,000. But the lender is only going to advance 75 or 80 percent of that orderly liquidation value or forced liquidation value of the equipment, and they're going to determine this through an appraisal by an independent third party. So there's, there's often unrealistic expectations as to how much they can borrow. The good news on new and new equipment, going back to that, is a lot of manufacturers will provide the financing, and the story doesn't have to be that compelling. I mean, they want to sell equipment, they want their dealers to move the equipment, so they will try to, you know, find a way to justify selling a piece of equipment to a company that may not look all that strong from a cash flow perspective. Yeah. Tell us the definition of really what is a bridge loan? <laughs> yeah, that's a trick question too. <sighs> Technically or ideally, I don't know what the right word is, a bridge loan is a way to get you from point A to point B, short term. It's like a bridge. You've got to cross the river. You can't walk across because it's too deep. You don't have a boat, whatever. So you need a bridge. Financially speaking, you, companies usually need a bridge either to make an acquisition or to do something that's going to take a lot of capital that they can't really support at the moment. And so there are lenders that will do, these are generally what I would call opportunistic lenders, translation, mm -hmm. expensive. They'll come in and very quickly put together a deal, typically secured by most or all the assets of the company, and they'll put it in place for maybe six months to a year, sometimes a year and a half or two. But they need to be very well convinced, that is the lender, that there's a clear-cut way they're going to get out of this in the six months mm -hmm. or the one year. Or the, and that's where bridge lending gets challenging because it's often hard to come up with a, a real convincing and true story about how this money is going to be repaid. It can't just be, I'm going to use this money to grow sales. That, that's not going to work. It might be, let's just say a guy's got a chance to buy a manufacturing plant for his business or a warehouse or something. Mm -hmm. his merchandise, and he's got to close the deal in a month or 14 days. That could be a bridge loan situation, but then what you need is some sort of a takeout. You, you need to have a commitment of some sort that will take the bridge lender out in a short period of time. It's very, very hard. Short okay. It's very, very hard to, to arrange or convince the bridge lender that there's a clear-cut takeout. Okay. And that's, that's the problem with bridge loans. They sound great, but it's hard to get them because being able to convince the lender or show them, it's not convince them, it's show them factually that you have a commitment from a bank subject to documentation or something, or you have some other more traditional type of financing lined up, you just can't close it right away. But that's hard to do. So people okay. call, call, kind of, call them bridge loans, but really it boils down to getting financing together quickly, however you can do it. Okay. Well, lastly, can I tell us about what other services your company offer? Yeah, I'm I'm very very focused on managing capital projects for small and middle market businesses. I don't do M and A. I really don't do much in equity. It's mainly senior debt and other debt related products. And the service I offer is really to help the business owner and or the financial people of the company manage the process so that they get the result they want. I help them get prepared list of data we talked about. It's not just to have the data. It's, I analyze it, try to understand what the trends are in the business, what that means to a lender, help them put it all together in a way that the lender can understand why this is a good risk for him. Mm -hmm. Lender's got to underwrite the deal. I, I, I like to say I pre-underwrite the deal for my clients so that lenders will either like it right away or won't like it right away. And in many cases, I'm going through as many as 50 or 60 different lenders to get 
I mean, it's it's just an astoundingly tough market out there, right? Wow. And I'm not smart enough to know exactly which lender is going to do this particular deal. I believe in giving deals wide distribution. I don't like doing that because, man, the amount of time it takes for me to deal with that many different lenders, it's crazy. But that's the service I offer. I do that. I talk to the mm-hmm. lenders. Listen to this one, though, Tim. I never sell a deal. My client has to sell the deal. It's always management that sells the deal. If I okay. sell the deal for well, it doesn't work. It's not my credibility at stake. It's theirs. They need to be the ones that the lender has confidence in. I just help them get prepared to generate that confidence in the lender and then manage the whole process A to Z for them. Wow. And anything else you would like to leave us, advice to people who's looking for debt and equity financing, any advice you would like to give them that they need to be prepared to do this, they need to have this done, they need to credit also is going to be part of that scenario, business and personal credit. Anything else you'd like to leave us with? Well, I'll do it this way, and it may, well, it won't sound self serving because I won't talk about triangle capital, but I think the mistake a lot of businesses make is they don't seek competent help. They don't even think about it in terms of meeting their capital needs. They go talk to this bank, they go talk to that bank, they try to get an SBA loan, whatever they do, mm-hmm. and, and they keep getting declined. Well, my advice is when you have one or two or three declinations, Start thinking about it might be your accountant that can help you. It might be a professional service provider like me. It might be an investment bank. But but they need to they need to change the way they're going about it. And they okay. may need to go to a different audience that they're not aware of. But mainly, they need someone third party to help them understand why they're getting declined and overcome those reasons, help them overcome those reasons. Okay, Paul. And how can they contact you and your company? Good question. <laughs> Phone number is 770-675-3139. I've got a website, trianglecapitalaccess.com or jsloan at trianglecapitalaccess.com. Okay, so your number is 770-675-3139. Okay, and you're located, you do business nationally, but you're located outside of uh, Atlanta? Right. Atlanta suburb, Marietta. Okay. And the website is trianglecapitalaccess.com. And your email address is if you can spell it out for them just in case they. Yeah. J for Jeff Sloan, S L O A N E, at mm-hmm. trianglecapitalaccess. That's A C C E S S dot com. Well, I really appreciate you coming on the, on the program, Jeff, and talking about financing. Thank you so much. Well, it's been a lot of fun, Tim. I appreciate it. Okay, great. Thank you again. Take care. Take care. Yeah, okay, Again, it's been another production of the Core Business Show with Tim Jacquet. You can download this episode on iTunes on Blog Talk Radio or podcast or Podbean. Thank you for listening to the program today. And, and if you have any reviews about these episodes, please go ahead and write them in the Blog Talk area. But if you prefer, go ahead and go to iTunes and write your comments, something that you want us to talk about. You can email us as well, topics that you want to know about. Email us at info at applecapitalgroup.com. Thank you for listening, everybody, and have a great day. Thank you for listening to The Core Business Show with Tim Jacquet. For a free quote on equipment leasing and financing, visit our website, applecapitalgroup.com. That's applecapitalgroup.com. And fill out the information to receive your free quote. We hope you'll join us for our next episode. And remember, you can always get to The Core via iTunes. You'll find all our previous episodes there. Thanks again for listening to The Core Business Show with Tim Jacquet.